Welcome to our 2023 Gardens for Peace and Rake Day webinar. My name is Marisa Rodriguez and I'm the NAJCA manager. And NAJCA, or the North American Japanese Garden Association, is an association that is committed to connecting and supporting the Japanese garden community. Since 2011, we have offered opportunities to connect and learn through conferences, regional events, and webinars. And today, we are commemorating the UN's International Day of Peace, um, which many of you know is this Thursday, September 21st. So we'll start today's webinar by showcasing some of our Gardens for Peace projects. In fact, the very first video tells a little bit more about Gardens for Peace and its purpose. Um, this year we had 27 gardens from all over the place participate, both public and private. After that compilation video, which is about seven and a half minutes, um, we'll turn things over to Dr. Kendall Brown, who will join us to share his expertise on gardens as symbols of international peace. And we'll end from hearing from a few panelists, Heather Grisbeck, Susan Kabazinskas, Kate Karen, all um, of whom are G4P participants, and Alo Lee from Longview, um, who will share more with us about Rake Day and this exciting partnership that we started this year and hope to continue for many years um, in the future. So after the panelists speak, we'll turn things, uh, we'll turn the floor over to you for your questions and comments. So please jot them down. Um, you can share them in the chat. I'll be looking for them there as well. So let's start by sharing our Gardens for Peace projects. The Earl Burns Miller Japanese Garden, or EBMJG, is participating in the North American Japanese Garden Association, or NAJGA program, Gardens for Peace. Japanese gardens serve as a bridge between cultures and promote both personal and community healing. They are an important vehicle to promote peace and understanding across continents. Public and private Japanese gardens will pull the rake for peace, utilizing a special peace pattern designed by Mrs. Toshiko Tanaka, a Hiroshima-based artist who is an A-bomb survivor and world peace advocate. Gardens for Peace is for peace, and our garden is a space for healing and contemplation. Gardens for Peace is for community, and our garden is a space for the CSULB campus, Long Beach, and all visitors and residents of the LA region. Gardens for Peace is for exploration, and our garden has always been a space for learning. We host students of every age and ability throughout the school year and summer. The EBMJG and NAJGA are dedicated Gardens for Peace partners.
represent these worlds, their pavilions and gardens as peace. Uh, and uh, as those of you who know history, Japan is sort of uh, imitating Western colonialism and imperialism and, and the invasions of its neighboring Asian countries in the 30s. Uh, and so, for example, at the, in 1939-40, uh, there were two World's Fairs in America, San Francisco and New York, none in Europe because Europe is in the middle of World War II or actually the beginning of World War II. Uh, so Japan is a major presenter at these American World's Fairs. And I'm showing you uh, a poster uh, on the right, a photo, color photo on the left, a detail black and white of the Japanese garden, the back of a postcard describing the Japanese garden at that New York World's Fair, which was 1939 and 40, summer of two years. And then a quote, this is from the New York Times. Uh, actually, the quote is uh, from... A week after Pearl Harbor in 1941, that the Japanese government had, as we see in paragraph two, right after the World's Fair closed in the middle of September 1940, the government of Japan, through its consul general, gave this pavilion and garden to the city of New York, out in Flushing Meadow, where the uh, tennis center now is. And, and the consul general said, uh, in a world of turmoil, uh, that may this beautiful pavilion and garden stand in this park forever as a monument for aspirations for peace and goodwill. Well, one year later, uh, go to the top of this newspaper article, City of New York is tearing down the garden. So uh, I think that's a kind of good symbol that clearly... Uh, for all their good intentions, when nations have political economic differences, they go to war. Uh, what happened to Japanese gardens in America during the war? I, uh, over on the right is an article by me uh, from the Nazga Journal a few years ago, if you're interested and want to read more. It's, it's a fascinating story. Some gardens were destroyed. Memphis, New Orleans, some public Japanese gardens were destroyed. Often the, the, they were, this destruction was criticized and it was destroyed by the local uh, city governments. People said, this, is, this garden is not our enemy. Japanese culture is not our enemy. Uh, and so, in fact, most Japanese public gardens in America survived the war. And as we know, this was a bloody, as John Dower, the famous historian, wrote the title of a book. Uh, this was a war without mercy uh, from both sides. Uh, but I'm going to use here briefly, this is the, San, the most famous uh, Japanese garden in America, the Japanese Tea Garden in San Francisco. Uh, right after Pearl Harbor, the city uh, government said, well, we're going to take the garden out. We're going to make it an American garden, have statues of soldiers or President Roosevelt or generals. Then there was the idea to make it a Chinese garden. And there was an uproar in San Francisco, just reading this Chronicle and other newspaper letters to the editors. There's just dozens of them. And generally, public opinion was let's save the garden. The garden is not our enemy. So I'm, I have an article here by a Dr. Walter E. Schott, a little um, research online in the census shows us that he's a 63-year-old doctor born and raised in England, but a long San Francisco re uh, resident. He makes the good point uh, I put in, in bold from his article you know, it's uh, governments that go to war. The, the people of the countries are basically fine and behave pretty decently. And here we are, San Franciscans, at an opportunity, uh, what to do with this Japanese symbol of, of Japanese-ness at a moment when we're going to war and we're interning Japanese-Americans. And Schott argues, let's show our respect for something that that ha that has is an asset. And the garden is itself the pursuing of peace and things beautiful. Uh, and that these things, like Japanese gardens, can do no harm and they do much good. And then uh, Shot, a doctor, ends in the uh, last part, paragraph of his letter, I have visited the garden several times for 40 years, and without becoming sentimental, it still does something to me that a cocktail bar has yet to do. Uh, the, the, if the garden is desecrated, its name is changed, its... Uh, content has changed. This is not a blot to Japan, but a blot to our civil civilization. So we can either be morons or we can act like intelligent people and value cultural surroundings. So this is, you know, just a letter is written in March 1942. Uh, so, and the good news is that most gardens uh, behaved more or less in, in this way. Now, uh, 
what happened. So I, I've written several articles on world's fairs and gardens and symbols of peace. In fact, at the upper right is an article you can find online in the journal Sightlines, a journal of place, uh, my article Fair Japan. And over at the right, in fact, there was a book uh, called um, Foreign Trends on American Soil on Foreign Garden Styles in America. And I wrote an article there. So if you want to read more about this, you can. But uh, from the Sightlines article, which is available online free, uh, basically my conclusion is, of course, gardens weren't going to prevent a war. So did they have any impact? Was it just kind of empty symbolism? I think not. Arguably, war was maybe put off a little. Uh, it took a little longer for the sides to go to war based on friendly relations symbolized by gardens. But I think more importantly, after the war, uh, in the late 40s and 50s, Americans embraced Japanese culture pretty dramatically. And I would, you know, after a bloody war, and I would argue that it was the residual goodwill earned by Japanese gardens and other things, but uh, gardens certainly key among them, that allowed America and Japan to, uh, and America as the conqueror, to not to be a vicious conqueror, but a very uh, relatively congenial one. And articles like, uh, or, you know, Tea House of the August Moon, which was a play, a novel, a movie, and then things like Japanese Deer Park uh, in Los Angeles in the Orange County in the 1960s were down at the bottom. They had their great Tea House of the August Moon, and these are, you know, very touristy, but at a time when war War wounds are still pretty deep and raw, that uh, gardens are a, a kind of a healing balm. And at the very um, most basic level, I think that these pre-war Japanese gardens, gardens intended as symbols of many things, including peace, they really put Asian culture into the American public space in a way that could not be erased, was not erased. Nobody wanted to erase. So in the post-war period, we have a new type of Japanese public garden in America, and these are sister city gardens. The sister city movement comes right out of a conference uh, held by President Dwight Eisenhower in the White House on citizen to citizen diplomacy. This is obviously part of the Cold War. America's new enemy is the Soviet Union. We're trying to repair relations in, uh, with our former enemies, now our allies, West Germany and Japan. And Eisenhower writes, this is in the upper left, the, we, we are devoted to the great promise of, sorry, it's, it's cut off on my screen, but, uh, you know, of citizen to citizen, person to person diplomacy. And in fact, to promote peace through mutual respect, understanding, cooperation, one individual, one community at a time, this is the motto, the mission statement of the Sister Cities International. And a number of gardens, the Japanese Friendship Garden in San Diego came directly out of this, the Japanese Friendship Garden, uh, you have a postcard in the center top. Uh, many, many gardens are related to the Sister City movement. Portland Japanese Garden is, and certainly recently they have been celebrating their history, 60 years of harmony and peace coming out of this post-war citizen to citizen diplomacy. I'm gonna come back to this theme in, in just a minute. Uh, maybe the ultimate example of gardens as symbols of peace uh, was the peace bell built uh, at the United Nations in New York, first in 1952 and presented in 1954, right after the American occupation, Allied occupation of Japan ended. Uh, and the bell sort of sat there lonesome and little used until the Japanese government in the early uh, late 1990s and then again in the early 2000s sponsored the creation of a garden around it. Now, unfortunately, this garden and the Peace Bell are not accessed by the public, not even on the UN tour. Uh, as the arrow shows down at the bottom, the Japanese Peace Bell is traditionally rung twice a year, the vernal equinox, and then right now here in late September on International Peace Day. And it's sort of a photo op, as you can see in the photo of the right, each um, head of the UN rings it and dignitaries show up, but it, it sits there as a sort of, as a lovely space built by Shinabe of Zen Associates, but little used most of the year. And so this brings us to, to Gardens for Peace. So we sort of, uh, you know, I, I think Gardens for Peace, and it was a wonderful to have 27 different public and private gardens participating. And this idea of commemorating using gardens of peace, but in a rather creative way. It's not just that photo op symbolism of their name, but doing things in them, raking the, the peace ring that uh, Ms. Tanaka from Hiroshima came up with doing all sorts of other activities. 
Uh, I've participated in several of these. Uh, in fact, at Manzanar, a garden built by interned or incarcerated Japanese Americans in Eastern California uh, in 1942, 43, 44. Uh, Jeff Burton, the camp archaeologist who's uncovered many of these gardens, uh, has had peace day activities. Now they weren't rake, doing raking or other things, but it was simply talking about and showing and exposing this garden built by Japanese Americans in a incarceration internment relocation camp during a war in which their the country they have come from, in in which many of their relatives still fight, uh, live, is fighting the country in which they now live. And in the middle of this, you know, tremendous. Uh, time of dislocation and turmoil and some Japanese being sent back to or wanting to go back to Japan, the ones in the camp build these gardens, dozens of gardens, spectacular gardens like Merritt Park. So Jeff has, has uh, wanted to make just bringing um, these camp gardens into the conversation. It's the making the garden and now repairing the garden that becomes the act of peace. And I'm going to use this as a transition for my own ideas, when we're kind of shifting from, from peace as, you know, nation to nation, to now peace as individual. And remember, the Sister Cities International Mission is mutual respect, understanding, cooperation, one community, one nation, one city, one sister city, but one individual. And I want to sort of try and relocate our discussion to individuals. So two years ago, when I was up at Manzanar doing a lecture and then a garden walkthrough, uh, there were three women there. Uh, and they, I asked them, you know, what, what brings you here? And they said, we work for the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office. That's not your usual um, Japanese garden uh, kind of support group. And I said, why did you come to this? And they said, well, we work in trauma recovery. We work with witnesses, you know, and there's a lot of trauma in San Bernardino County and across the country. The people who are victims of crime, they then have to testify. Loved ones have been killed, murdered. They have to testify. They're in fear for their lives. And the women who worked in this, you know, really critical trauma recovery center for crime victims said, not only are our are kind of clients traumatized, but we seeing this every day are traumatized. And we thought we needed some way to sort of deal with it. So we thought we would make a garden and we made a rose garden. That's why I have this photo of a rose garden on the upper left, but it didn't work. Rose gardens were thorny and it's not giving us what we want. So we, we saw this idea, Japanese gardens in peace, and we, we came. So uh, I said, well, I think what you guys need to do is, you know, go to public gardens near you or encourage them to do act uh, to to uh, embrace activities that help people as individuals uh, find peace themselves. And so as as we know, and I don't I'm, I'm going to go over this very quickly because I think we all know it, uh, that starting at the Morikami Garden in the late 2000s, and Heather is here, uh, Garden, the Stroll for Wellbeing. And this has been adapted by gardens across the country uh, in which, you know, people suffering trauma, in, in other words, in need of peace, uh, do things, journaling, walk, mindful walking, um, sharing if they want to, and you can see some of the testimonials here from the website. Um, other gardens, and this is just really a great success story, I think, in the 21st century, and I'm just using the Anderson as a model, and I remember well talking with the Anderson in the 1990s, is it appropriate to do activities in the gardens? Is Are we losing the authenticity? I encourage them, uh, uh, go for it, that, you know, that they have meditation for grief and resilience. They have mindful grief wandering. You can do it on your own if you don't want to do it with a, a hospice group. Uh, there's all sorts of awareness and serenity walks, group or self-guided, uh, talking about the impact of nature, doing things, yoga, tai chi. And of course, these are not symbolic things once a year, but they're they're ongoing. And the use of sound and, and gong bath. And I was delighted to see that at Inishfree, that sense of, of sound and really making the gardens multi-sensorial. And let's, I'm going to uh, end with um, Martin McKellar and my... Uh, idea of the rake's progress. So uh, uh, as some of you probably know, um, that uh, the Harn Museum, it was a great museum, University Art Museum, they added a new Asian wing. 
uh, 20 years or so ago. And Hoichi Kurusu designed the garden, rooftop garden or terrace garden on the left, but he had a little leftover time and materials. Uh, and so he said, well, I'm going to take another rooftop garden around the side that was not really commissioned. He got permission and he put some stones and uh, gravel and poured a path and they couldn't plant any trees. So they just put some pl potted plants in there. It sat kind of falling into disuse until the remarkable docent, he was a docent in the Asian art collection, nothing to do with gardens, Martin McKellar said, hey, you know, I'm here volunteering. I'm going to start raking this garden. And he raked it. And this is my subtitle, A Rake's Progress. And as he raked it, he found peace and serenity and creativity. And uh, he wrote a great article uh, that is in one of our Nazca journals, reprinted. And then he, I was thinking of Martin's. And he uh, said he wants to share this idea of raking. So I pushed him a little. I said, there's a hospital next to you, Martin, on the University of Florida campus. I mistakenly parked there when I came to visit. Uh, could you do something with their patients? And again, there's a Nazca Journal article on this, so I won't go into too much detail. But through the uh, arts uh, in kind of healing uh, program through the School of Nursing and the Medical School at University of Florida with engineering students, the Innovation Academy with landscape architecture students with Martin. Uh, they developed a program, I hope it's still uh, continuing, where people, and this is for seriously ill people who cannot leave their hospital room waiting, hopefully life saving surgery uh, are now making with a 3D rake a design that volunteers, including friends and family of those patients, then rake into the garden wearing GoPro um, cameras so the person in the hospital room uh, can see their artistic creativity. And then they preserve this through videos. So it's really, I think, a great example of it's not nation to nation healing, but it's again, remember, individual level. That's part of the sister city's mission and creating peace. So I think uh, this is as good a place to stop as any as kind of tracing some steps, some progress in gardens and peace and using Martin McKellar here as the final word. Thank you. So uh, there is the sort of where we've gone from 1940 to 2023. Yeah, okay. Stop you. sharing. Thank you, Ken. Um, you know that. Thank you for sharing that valuable lecture on just how gardens have played a role um, as symbols of peace and, and how they've been important players in their communities in promoting peace, well-being um, and understanding, as you were saying, you know, at not just, you know, obviously at nation to nation level, but community level and at the individual level. Um, so now I want to bring in our panelists. So each panelist is going to answer a question um, sort of related to their participation. And then Allo um, from Longview will share more about Rake Day. So Heather, I'd like to start with you. Um, you are the curator, the garden curator at the Murakami Museum and Japanese Gardens and Delray Beach, Florida. So question for you is you have participated in Gardens uh, Gardens for Peace for several years. What's been the impact on your team and more Kami's visitors as a result of this project? So first, I want to say that I am so excited to hear that we had a total of 27 gardens participated over the years. I know we were always just, you know, trying to beat, you know, our, our record as far as how many gardens were participating and how many um, people we were, we were meeting with our mission. So uh, congratulations to the Najka for, for sure, for, for reaching that 27 mark. Um, as far as the Gardens for Peace impact, you know, it's changed for us over the years. Um, you know, we started off with just a very small kind of involvement in it, um, and then it, you know, has grown. Um, so for my team, interestingly enough, you know, raking a rock garden in 95 degree heat with 100% humidity can can be a little mundane and daunting, right? Um, and then, of course, all that hard work and all that mindfulness and all that wonderful heart and kokoro that put into that job, you know, can just be destroyed by one rainstorm, <laughs> you know, or one unruly visitor that decides they want to get that perfect Instagram shot. So for them, I think that that being allowing the their kind of talents and ideas and creativity as far as um, you know what this is able to promote, I think has broken up that kind of you know just daunting task. Um, although it is still one of my favorite jobs to do, um, you know it does kind of 
give a little bit of creativity and use the Karen Sui garden in a different way, right? So most of the time when visitors come, they get to see it, right? They don't get to really do much other than just look, reflect, and, you know, kind of move on. So I think that using it in a different way, especially for communicating and kind of bringing together 27 gardens on, you know, one mission for peace, I think is, is just wonderful. Um, as far as the visitors, um, I do a few uh, rock garden cultural demonstrations um, throughout the year. And it's always kind of this secret world, right? So if you know, you know, and if you don't know, we give them this ability to learn and then share with others. It's almost like taking this secret knowledge and being able to then share it with others. So I really, really love that. Um, and um, I think actually trying it. So when we give that ability to people to actually pull the rake, it's not something that um, uh, is offered a lot. Um, it's not common in Japan at all. So I think it's once again, this kind of secret world that um, we're using to then communicate something bigger, right? So, so the bigger idea of peace and how we can use something like a more abstract garden or a common sense way to communicate. Thank you, Heather. So our next panelist is Susan Kapazinskas from Japan House. Welcome, Susan. So what was the community's response to the public raking of the pattern? What thoughts, feelings, responses, reflections were shared? Right. Thank you, Marisa, for having me attend today. Uh, the Japan House is located on the campus of the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And to celebrate um, Gardens for Peace, we, uh, they held a tea ceremony inside the Japan house and there were garden tours given and uh, participants were encouraged to write their ref a reflection for peace on cranes, which we hung in our dry garden area. And um, it was well received. Um, people, really do enjoy coming to the Japan house. And some of the thoughts and reflections that were shared were, you know, of, everybody loves peace. I mean, how can you go wrong? <laughs> really, um, no one was against peace or war. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all against war and we want peace. So things that people shared were uh, sentiments like be kind, may all the children of the world have peace in their hearts. Uh, may we you, may we be united countries with peace for us all. Uh, there were many, many wishes for peace and happiness, uh, wishes for compassion and understanding. Um, and it was, you know, it was very solemn when we went through our dry garden area. And um, because, well, it's, it's just, you know, the pattern designed by uh, a survivor of the A-bomb that really was, um, it was a reflective moment for people on the tour. So we enjoy participating. This was the second year I've raked the pattern. And I think this is our, the Japan house's third year that we've participated. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Susan. And our, um, we'll go to Kate Karen next. So Kate is the landscape curator at the Innisfree Garden in New York. So Kate, what do you think is the importance of a program like Gardens for Peace? How do gardens play a role in larger community issues and contribute to healthy communities? Um, well, first of all, thank you for organizing this program. And <clears throat> I agree, 27 gardens participating. I mean, <laughs> great job. Um, so. You know, I think even in a time where the world seems to be getting like crazier and crazier politically, um, gardens are safe places. You know, they're they're places that we can go and it doesn't matter who you voted for. It doesn't matter anything. Um, and so I think to work with that concept is is really powerful. It gives us a chance to address a major issue, but as um, the woman just before me said, 
we're all for peace. <laughs> you know? um, so it's it's sort of a, a, a great coming together. I think um, I also actually, I actually use um, some, one of the first things that Ken Brown told me when I was trying to learn about Japanese gardens and about Innisfree. And he said, you know, Innisfree captures the feeling that you have in nature in a Japanese garden. So there aren't many outward signs. Uh, there's no Tory gate, there are no stone lanterns, there are no anything like that. But but the more I study and the more I learn and the more I visit, you know, there is this amazing feeling that is different from other aesthetics. And um, to be able to give that to people, especially today, that feels really deeply important. So we don't have um, a Kari Sansui. We can't pull the rake unless people want to come and rake leaves. Um, so we try to make programs that are about um, ways that Japanese gardens might have been used, seasonal observations. Uh, this year, for the first time, we are having a moon viewing. We um, we had a meteor shower and sunrise viewing. Well, I, I have to tell you, we sold out at 250 people coming at four o'clock in the morning for that. I mean, that's like insane, right? But the idea that the garden is a place to kind of gather and celebrate something really simple, but truly miraculous. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, there was a lot of caffeine, <laughs> But at the same time, you know, people people felt grounded and they left having shared something remarkable. Um, we had a sunrise sound bath, another way to kind of have that sort of communal observation. And, you know, you guys do great programming about sound and Japanese gardens. And so I thought about that. Um, so it's peace at a different, you know, maybe a metaphysical level that we're trying to achieve. Um, we also have been lucky enough over the past several years to work with some really remarkable um, traditional Japanese musicians, um, shakuhachi players, and um, last year also somebody played the Ichigenkin, which is a very unusual one-stringed instrument. Um, and so they came back this year and did a concert and they were, they love the Gardens for Peace program. So these two people that play all over the world, one trained with a living national treasure in Japan, although they're both Americans, you know, they love the idea that they could be in a garden and make a sound experience um, connected to nature, connected to Japan that would give um give people peace for you know an hour or so and um again that was like crazy amounts of people just sort of showed up some were you know if you could be a shakuhachi groupie they were there um others had never even heard of the instrument but they just loved the idea of a japanese bamboo flute and sitting in the garden and listening to something that just sort of the thought of it sounded so relaxing so peaceful so i think um, reminding people that these kinds of experiences are available, um, bridging a connection to nature for people. And I, I really think I'm a landscape architect. I think that's what gardens do. They make a place for people to be, to be alone, to be together, but to be in nature. And the way Japanese gardens do that is special, is particular. And I think it's really about that sensation of peace. And so where you go with that from there, I mean, obviously just in the couple of people that have been talking, there are many, many routes you can take, um, but it's it's an incredible resource for communities. And the idea that you've created this program that gives us words to put to sometimes difficult to articulate aspects of being in gardens is a real gift. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. So now I'd like to welcome Alo Lee from Longview. So as I shared earlier in the webinar, this is our first year partnering um, with Longview on Rake Day. So Alo, if you could just share a little bit more about Rake Day um, and why you're advocating for limiting the use of leaf blowers. Hello. Hey, y'all. My name's Alo. I'm the Living Collections Manager here at Longview House and Gardens. 
Um, Living Collections is just a really cool way of saying I manage the garden space here. Um, and so thank y'all for having me. Um, and I wanted to point out, Kate, I love what you said about gardens are safe spaces and, and it, it doesn't matter who you voted for when you get there. Cause I meet so many different people from all walks of life coming through the garden. And it's just great to connect with people in that way. So I appreciate you for pointing that out. Um, so yes, today is rake day, September 19th. And um, our executive director, Beatty Landis is a huge advocate for raking. Um, we actually started this initiative in uh, 2019 um, and we've been leaf blower free ever since. That's when she also started uh, working here. So a positive change that came about under Beatty's direction. Um, I personally love raking because of the, the lower noise pollution. Leaf blow, I have the world sensitive ears. I don't even go to movie theaters. So I don't want to be around loud leaf blowers in the garden um, and using them for extended periods of time with that long exposure can cause tinnitus and your in hearing loss. So I do appreciate the use of rakes um, and not only for noise pollution, but you know, leaf blowers can cause um, soil erosion. Um, they can cause um, things to be kicked up and you're not just raking or blowing up the leaves. You're also blowing around fertilizers and pesticides that we put in place and so raking just minimizes that, that harsh impact from, from those things being um, kicked around. Um, and there's no harmful emissions from a rake, right? And I, I like physical activity. I like working outdoors. So I do prefer to rake. It's just, you know, Southern girls don't sweat. We glisten. So I am all about raking. <laughs> um, and also, you know, if you have some diseases in your landscape and in your green space, um, blowing those leaves around could spread that disease. So just raking is a little bit more of a controlled way to handle um, your garden maintenance. Um, and I also want to point out that leaf floors can dry your soil. And if I live here in Louisiana. We've been through a drought for many months and uh, we just had a whole lot of rain. So if we were to blow a, a leaf blower right now with those leaves that fell in that rainfall on our camellias, we'd be blowing around that algae spot from that those uh, camellia species that we had. So I just advocate for, for raking for those reasons. Um, because we are a national historic landmark, it is important for us to maintain the grounds just as they were when Ellen Biddle Shipman designed them in the 1930s. And so, yeah, I do, most of my team, we are really, really, really sticklers for the raking. Um, today, we had about 30 to 40 volunteers come out um, and help us rake. We do this every year on September 19th. Um, and we're we're expecting it to get even bigger because we are national now, thanks to, you know, North American Japanese Garden Association and so a few other organizations we partner with throughout the U.S. Um, so this kind of exposure is great for us. We're really spreading our mission. We're really spreading the word about how helpful raking is um, and the benefits of it. And yeah, I'm just happy to be here. If you're ever in New Orleans, please stop by and see us at Longview House and Gardens. I believe we got our National Historic Landmark um, designation in 2005. And that is the reason we got that is because of our gardens. And this is the masterwork of landscape architect uh, Ellen Biddle Shipman. So we're, we're following in her footsteps. We're still using her old blueprints that still have dirt on them from the 1900s up in our archives. and. We take pride in, you know, doing things by her book and by her way, so. Excellent. Thank you, Allo. And yes, we definitely look forward to continuing our partnership with you in future years um, and helping to, to spread that message for sure. Yes, thank you. So thank you, everybody, for participating and responding to, to the questions that we had for you. But now I'd like to turn it over to the audience. Um, I know we have some Gardens for Peace participants in the audience um, and other people, you know, who might have some questions. I don't know if anybody wants to share anything more about your Gardens for Peace project experience um, or if we have any questions for Ken, for Aloe, for any of our Gardens for Peace participants. And yeah, maybe I can step in. Uh, I'm not Steven Pitsenbarger. I'm uh, Matt Strader, his employee. Uh, I'll take my hat off there. Thank you so much. I really appreciated this uh, presentation. I uh, work at the San Francisco Japanese Tea Garden, and uh, we 
I really appreciated doc, actually uh, Dr. Brown's uh, discussion of our garden because um, I feel so much uh, that the garden is a peaceful place and that people come um, kind of just in a contemplative mood wanting restoration. And then we have this other message here at the tea garden. We actually have a peace lantern and a plaque that uh, states that it was donated by the children of Japan to promote um, peace. And sometimes I just don't feel like um, our message is strong enough. And one of the things I think I, I just want to recap that I felt I've been thinking and feeling um, is that peace gardens and the promote, promotion of peace seems to be both thinking and feeling kind of experience. Like it's a feeling a sense of peace, but thinking about um, things that are important to promoting peace. And it seems like a lot of people's way of expressing that, because I feel like we have trouble at this garden. We're very crowded, um, usually with uh, park patrons, is um, just conveying that message. And it seems like people are doing that with programming, uh, which is not something we do a lot of. Um, I just wanted to dwell on that a little bit, because I think that might be an answer that we need here. Um, I do think that when gardens are really crowded, it's it's hard. It feels like the peace comes back to the garden when it's when there are not as many people, but the activities are a way to um, to talk about it, which is I think something that that works well. Anyway, that's just a comment I had. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Kate. Um, yeah, I I think that's a great idea. I just wanted to respond to your um, your sort of open ended query because I think people if you start them on the road to thinking about what peace means in the garden, the next time they come, you don't need to be there with them. They're going to be thinking that more, or even if they just read about the programming. So I I think you don't have, it doesn't have to be a huge lift, um, but maybe even just doing something for this, this program is a way to start articulating that about your garden. Um, and over time, you know, I, I think you'll see that it it has an impact. So I, I think even people that don't come to our autumnal equinox moon viewing will be thinking about what they're going to notice in the garden differently. So give it a try. Any other thoughts on this question? Or other questions? Well, let me jump in there. I, 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 I also uh, I agree with Allo, uh, who uh, pointed out how important Kate's point was that gardens are safe spaces, and that's why I'm a little, little leery of too politicizing them, uh, because and I, I think that Matt put his finger on it. You feel peace, and and gardens need to really bring out that feeling of peace, which might mean keeping down the crowds and certainly keeping out the leaf blower sound. And then as Case said, just the kind of easy lift to turn them from feeling peace to thinking about it. You know, how do you take the experience in the garden and then make it part of your life? And I think that public gardens can do a lot to just make that simple kind of transition. Maybe that's something we can focus on in future Gardens for Peace uh, discussions and days. Absolutely. I think that's also um, helping people name it because, you know, we're all busy and we're sort of like, oh, I love going to such and such garden and I have this way that I walk around and, and you don't think about what it is that you like about it. And I think sometimes something like this helps us say, oh, I really do feel peaceful there or you know, so it 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 can be just a a subtle something that helps launch someone on like being more mindful about their experience without being bossy. Um, so, thank you, Pete. Any other thoughts, questions, something other gardens for peace participants would like to share? Oh, Jeanette, go ahead. This. This is such a wonderful program. I did just want to encourage all the participants, whatever ideas are coming to your mind as you're doing this program, um, please 
uh, you know, make an effort to pick one of those ideas and go with it for next year. Uh, because I think that's the way we translate our good intentions into action that has impact in our communities. And, uh, you know, I just love hearing what you've all done and uh, we'll be looking forward to next year and uh, how many gardens will be able to participate and what the impact will be in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. And hopefully, you know, through just the information shared today, you can see just the diversity of projects. So obviously we have lots of gardens that raked the piece pattern that was designed um, by Mrs. Toshiko Tanaka, um, but other gardens that are using the same design in creative ways or gardens that are not using the design at all and doing other really creative um, ideas. And Kate, I think you highlighted many of them, um, including the Peace Concert. And so, you know, we really want gardens to be creative, to um, incorporate this concept of Gardens for Peace in whatever way is meaningful for your garden, for your team, for your communities. Um, and I know one of the things that Kate, you and I have talked about is just how Najka maybe can, um, in the future, showcase more as projects are happening um, so that people in the community can also attend these events. So obviously you're pulling from your own, you know, constituents and communities to attend and participate in your events, but maybe Najka can help sort of spread the word to an even wider audience. And so gardens, you know, public and private can participate by raking or doing another activity that's meaningful to them, um, but also um, by inviting other people from their community to participate in, in these activities. Um, so I think, you know, as Jeanette said, you know, we're always looking for new ideas, how to make events like this more meaningful, um, expand them. So any ideas that you have, you know, we are very open to them. Um, and hopefully, you know, those of you that participated this year will continue to participate in future years. Um, and, and that list will only grow in, in future years. So any I have some yeah. comments. Yes, go ahead, Goichi. Uh, I have a posted number of comments on your chat board. So I would like all of you to take a look at and read them. And one particular one relates to what the Ken talked about. Do not politicize. Uh, but you cannot get away from that. Uh, the situation in Japan uh, as I noted in my chat, uh, that I just found out this study that over 80% of the agricultural lands surrounding the gardens in Japan are going to be destroyed. That will greatly impact the gardens in Japan. The Wait, only thing that, that can uh, rescue that is a political force. And then down at the bottom for the new program, uh, that's one I said, I'm asking you, there's all the uh, garden presented here today, have a clear mission statement for peace. And if not, please consider adapting it to your own situation. Thank you, Goichi. Any final comments, questions? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Shiota. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, the, this is Yoshinobu Shiota and my wife, Catherine Shiota, are from Maryland. And I'm happy, very happy to uh, inform you that now uh, Baltimore area is no longer Japan Garden Desert. Actually, we have worked with John Powell for the last few years and particularly last uh, four days uh, from Wednesday to Saturday to completely rehabish entry garden, which was called Asian Garden to Towson University Center for the arts uh, building 
and uh, I uh, just send some photos of the few hours young <laughs> uh, the you know garden uh, to Marisa uh, about maybe ten minutes ago. So, but uh, anyway, so uh, we are the definitely uh, the last uh, participant <laughs> for this year's uh, Garden for Peace. Uh, this morning, uh, Catherine and I uh, inscribed uh, Heiwa uh, according to Mrs. Tanaka's design. But, you know, this is a very small, tiny uh, garden, 30 by 30 and 1 by 30. So we couldn't really have a single spot to carry three characters. So we improvised to utilize uh, several locations. <laughs> and uh, we are hoping uh, we will keep attending, participating Garden for Peace project campaign uh, from uh, now on. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. And you were definitely our last Garden for Peace <laughs> participant. So that's very exciting. I know we had shared in our newsletter that you all um, were going to be working with John this past weekend. So that's wonderful, wonderful to hear. In fact, one of the things that I'll do after um, as the wrap up um, for this webinar is create a form where you can sign up for next year um, if you're interested in, in signing on for Gardens for Peace next year. So actually, one maybe quick question, we'll wrap with this question. Does the Gardens for Peace event engage directly with gardens, sister cities in Japan as well? Or does this involve gardens just in the US? That's a great question, Devani. Um, so currently, it's been basically almost exclusively gardens in North America. Um, both in Canada and in uh, the U.S. We have had a few gardens sign on uh, from Europe, but we absolutely want to include gardens worldwide, including in Japan. And so hopefully, you know, that's an opportunity for expansion where mm -hmm. we can really um, get beyond North America's borders um, and, and into other parts of the world. So absolutely. It hasn't, you know, happened in a super big way yet, but it is something that we hope will happen in the future. Great. Uh, we are involved in Ka Baltimore, Kawasaki, Sister City Committee as well. And certainly we can definitely ask. Yeah. And that's <laughs> actually, we can that's... convince them or not is to be seen, but uh, <laughs> we don't mind talking. Yeah. No. And that's actually a wonderful way, right? Many of our gardens have sister city relationships mm -hmm. um, with cities, you know, in Japan. So I think that's a great idea, Mr. Shota, as a way to um, begin those outreach efforts really in, in a stronger way. So with that, I think we will wrap up. I also want to thank David Reddick. I think, Dave, you're with us. Dave was on our original planning committee for Gardens for Peace, and this year was a sponsor for the, for the event. So, oh, and perfect. I see you and your team. Excellent. <laughs> thank you so much for all of your support of Gardens for Peace from, you know, Martin's vision <laughs> so many years ago now to today. Thank you, Dave, and, and your team at Red Egg Gardens, Fostering and Stewardship. And Dave, do you want to jump in and say a quick, a few quick words? Uh, sure. I uh, just want to say that it's been, uh, you know, so wonderful to be able to be a part of this project in different ways. I really think that, you know, from uh, when Martin first called me, he and I met in 2016 at Murakami and we just wanted to talk about raking and he's such a beautiful soul. He and I, you know, kind of a nice energy balance between the two of us and, you know, up and then Martin is Martin. And, uh, you know, it, it was so neat uh, when he would send me the little rakes and, and I just enjoyed so much um, uh, working on that with him and with Tanaka-san and with you, of course, Marissa and everybody else. And, um, wow, it's hard to believe that it went from those little talks to now like 27 gardens and everything else. And um, I know that myself and my team here, Kale and Tori, um, we're all just so thrilled to be part of this. And this is a big part of our year. And 
Um, you know, it reminds me of, I don't remember if Ken was talking to me or if I was just listening to him from afar, but one of the two happened. And uh, he mentioned that uh, we find our better angels in the garden. And that's kind of been a guiding mantra of ours as well. You know, in a garden, there is no fighting. In a garden, there is no um, bigotry and hate and all these things. And um, I truly believe that the good things that we do as, as humans uh, is born of peace and community. And um, the things that are difficult uh, and the bad, the the worst things are are done in 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 you know war and isolation, and that's where we can lose our way. So peace, community, and gardens for peace, such a beautiful and wonderful thing. And thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of it in this way this year. So it was wonderful to see everybody, and so fun to hear about all those wonderful projects. Thank you, Dave. Thank you again for all of your support over all of these years, um, and for leaving us with that inspiring message as well. So thank you all. We look forward to future webinars. And in October, we're going to be in Pittsburgh. Um, so if there's still time to register for the Pittsburgh event, if you're interested in, in joining the Najika community there. So thank you again all for your support. And I look forward to seeing you in person or via Zoom sometime soon. Thank you so much.